acknowledge the generosity of the anonymous donor who endowed this award. These these kinds of awards are uh, near non-existent for nonfiction writing of any kind and practically unicorn-like for academic writing. So uh, thank you very much to the anonymous donor uh, for this award. Um, I'd like to thank the, the Canadian Business History Association, Joe Martin and Mark Bonham uh, for this, uh, and the prize jury, which was Dimitri Anastakis, um, Rob McQueen, thank you very much, uh, Melanie Buttle and J. Andrew Ross for selecting the book. It's, it's a great honor to get this, uh, and thank you very much uh, for that, and to Ross Roxford for helping me. Uh, is Ross here today, or? Oh, I hope we saw him, I said thank you. So, um, I just wanted to say a couple of quick words about the, the book, and I'll do it by talking about this photograph, which is, uh, one of the more famous photos, it's, it's Harry Truman holding the Dewey defeats Truman, Harry Truman sort of going like that. It's, uh, this is um, the Democratic president of the United States holding up uh, a newspaper that erroneously announces that he lost the 1948 presidential election to his Republican opponent, Thomas Dewey. And it's often thought about as this thing that it's, it's sort of funny in the way that someone's screwing up a ceremonial first pitch is funny. You laugh, it's a gaffe, you put it, and then you move on. Um, but there's two, oh, as long as it's not you, I guess. But there's um, there's a couple things about the photo that often go without notice. And one of them is uh, that the, the the paper that published this, the, the Chicago Tribune, which is which the newspaper that, that published the headline, the, the edition, uh, which is probably what, which was at the time probably the most prominent right-wing newspaper in the United States. So it's a bit of very bold and wishful thinking on the Tribune's part as well. But the other thing that's, that's often unnoticed about this is that this, is, that, that this object held by a United States president uh, with the name of a prominent US city and there's an American flag in the masthead with a slogan, an American paper for Americans that ran under that on a daily basis. That, that thing, like most newspapers in the United States at the time, started as a tree in a Canadian forest. And so that's really what the book is about. It's about trying to make these connections between those trees and uh, American readers. Um, the digital age, the, the newspaper, the printed newspaper in the digital age is sort of uh, beleaguered, to say the least. Uh, and the title of the book comes from the phrase "dead tree media," which is a. It was sort of, um, I kind of, I, I give, I, it's a sort of Silicon Valley technorati term in some ways. Um, it's become, uh, and it's it's meant to kind of connote, talk about newspapers as being kind of dead, lifeless. Like, why are these things still here when there are these vibrant, participatory? metal and plastic things around that can give us news in a, in a, you know, in a flash. Um, and that's another part of the book, is that there's a literal truth in that, and that they, newspapers really are the products of felled trees. And 100 years ago, that's really, that's all they were. Um, so it, it's a book, the, what the book tries to do is offer a reconstruction of what a newspaper was, when, that's, when it was a piece of paper with news and advertising that you paid a certain amount of hard currency for on a daily basis. You had sections, you read the thing, and you took it away and you recycled it later. Um, it's about the labor processes that were involved in making them, it's about manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing processes involved in this. Um, it's a reminder that, that producing newspapers was not just about journalists and editors, although it was certainly important, it was about uh, lumberjacks and it was about paper mill workers. And for American readers, it was also about Canada. Um, the, when, the, when Harry Truman held up this, this edition of the Tribune in 1948, uh, Canada was by far, this, this, was, this was at the end uh, of about four decades in which newsprint had been made duty-free going to the United States. One of the only commodities that had this designation. You could, the way it was negotiated between 1911 and 1913 was the Canadians said, you want the trees, you can't have the trees, but if you build a mill and you make the newsprint, you can take the newsprint across the border free of a duty. So there was an integrated cross-border newsprint industry starting about 1911. So by the time Harry Truman did this, Canada was the world's leader, leading producer of newsprint. Uh, about 90% of the newsprint that they produced was sent directly to the United States, where it was 80% of the total newsprint used in the United States. So in other words, four out of five newspaper pages printed in the United States in the middle of the 20th century started as a tree in a Canadian forest. And so an American reader could, could pick up a newspaper on, on you know, in the morning, peruse the news and peruse the advertising and, and assume himself or herself informed, all the while not thinking at all about the processes that went into getting that paper to them. And that's where, I, what the book tries to do is start on the other end of it. Often in the winter where the logging was done, where the paper mills were built, where the lumberjacks were working, um, and talk about how that paper then got to the United States. It's a story of 
of technology and, and business strategy and in a lot of ways public policy, trade policy. This would not have been something that could have happened without the negotiation of the trade agreement uh, in 1911 and in 1913. So the book tries to basically go from the forest to the newsstand and show how, how these things, these objects that, that Americans took for granted and they had them on like, I think newspapers and sports teams are the only things that had a prominent geographic foci in the title and in the brand. Um, you, these, these people thought these were local things, and yet they were part of, a, of an international economy, part of cross-border trade and resource. Um, in a lot of respects, the book owes uh, its approach to a, a tradition of political economy pioneered, pioneered, pioneered here in Toronto by Harold Innes. This is about the exploitation of Canadian staple products by foreign powers. Um, so that's what the book is about. Um, I just want to say a, a, a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, one of them goes to uh, Stephen Salmon, who's uh, also a member of the Canadian Business History Association. He's a now retired archivist at Library and Archives Canada, and the, the book would have been impossible without the work that he did to get a collection of corporate documents from the Chicago Tribune's Canadian subsidiary. And it's it, there's it's an extraordinary collection of documents. And I, I, I emailed him, I emailed the library in 2011, not knowing that he would be on the other end, and he helped me get access to the collection. It was not yet open to the public at that time. I believe it's still closed to the public. But he, he shepherded me through getting to use it. Uh, and it, really, that collection is an extraordinary collection of corporate documents. And there's history waiting to be written out of it about, uh, about North American business history. Um, the Canadian Embassy uh, gave me a faculty research grant to fund the initial research. And uh, I had a Fulbright Fellowship to spend a year uh, at McGill University, uh, where Will Straw was a wonderful host of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. So I realized when we were driving into it, like there was a three-year period where I spent from 2011 to 14 more days in Canada than I did in the United States uh, <laughs> while working on this book. And those were very happy times. Um, and there's a lot of other people to thank their knowledge in the book. I, I want to thank just two as I finish. One is my editor uh, at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, Richard John, who's a professor uh, at Columbia University. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mara Bonnie for being a wonderful companion throughout, uh, before, during, and after writing the book. So, um, thank you, and thank you all for coming out. <laughs>
Um, it also it, it created uh, you know it created some dependencies. I mean, it, it exacerbated the depression in the 20s when uh, American demand went down significantly, went down, produced print significantly because there was less advertising being purchased, and therefore the American publishers needed to buy less papers. So um, it wasn't all roses when it came to the integration of the economy, but that was a story in which the the removal of the duty did do what people on both sides of the border wanted to do. And duty or tariff in that text context did the same thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the, the, um, I, the, there's a there's a, a biographical note on this that I uh, I don't want to make too much about this as a causal factor, but but when Brian Mulroney was in office negotiating the U.S. Canada Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA, uh, Mulroney's hometown, Baker Hall, was built by the Chicago Tribune. Um, to build a newsprint mill up in Canada, and there was there was a staple of, of well, some of Mulroney's stump speeches in the 1980s, where he talked about how there was nothing to worry about free trade. Look what happened to me. I was like, I I always he talks about this at some length in the introductory chapters of his autobiography as well. So there were echoes of it that came that ran down to the 1980s. So. Okay. And just while you're thinking, the next question, the next the next question. Remember that in addition to the award winning there's our latest book that is on free trade, so these will all be available to you at any time. The next question. So why did um, the uh, publisher have such huge influence in, in the sense of getting that, that yeah. tariff? tariff. Yeah. Today, uh, business people seem to have absolutely no influence on, on, our, on the president in terms of negotiating <laughs> <laughs> why was there so? Yeah. Why did they have so much power? I, you know, I think it was at the it, at that point they were the only game in town. There was no there was no radio. Uh, if you if you wanted to have a voice to reach the public, you needed to get you know the newspapers had the voice to reach the public. The politicians who wanted to reach the public favorably had to do so through cultivating relationships with newspapers, and and there was sort of no easier way to run afoul of them. Than, you know, in this respect. Yeah, I think it, it, it basically had to do with the fact that that was, you know, in the way that maybe, you know, network television might have been in the 1950s and 1960s. I mean, it, it, but it, they were really the only thing out there. I mean, it was everything was all print before about, like, before the mid-20s, it was newspapers and magazines. And they had to just, I think that really had everything to do with it, just the old and old. Was there a cozy relationship between the news? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, this was, yeah, this was still an era in which, uh, you know, the, the journalism is starting to talk about the rise of, of, of objectivity and often dated to the late teens, early 20s. But most most major newspapers were, I mean, they all endorsed candidates for president, and, and everybody knew what the politics of their local paper were. I mean, as long as there were competitive papers, and, and that was the situation in most, Ameri most major cities until the 70s, there was one that leaned one way and one that leaned the other. And so, um, but yeah, they were just, and that was, they were, they were it. They were the only, you know, this was, this was the era of Hearst, of Pulitzer, uh, of, of the press barons, and it was, it, they were king makers in, in that respect. So what about the U.S. domestic industry? Was there not, was there not an industry, or were they not powerful, or were they just, could they not produce enough? Uh, it was mostly the latter. So the, the development of the, the mass circulation newspaper in the United States slightly predates the development of an official conservation movement. Um, so if you think like you know Theodore Roosevelt takes office a little bit after yellow journalism, so it's a decade later. So a lot there had been a lot of cutting in the northern states where there were significant stands of spruce because that was at the time you wanted a softwood tree and mostly a northern climate tree. So it was Wisconsin, you know, Michigan was, had been cut over in the 19th century for mostly for construction material that was sent to Chicago, but Maine, uh, upstate New York. There'd been a lot of cutting around these mills, and there was this concern. I mean, Gifford Pinchot, who later becomes the chief forester of the U.S. Forest Service, testifies before Congress and says, "If you keep cutting, here's the here's how many years we have left in each of these states if this happens." Meanwhile, the people just up there have tons more of it because it's a northern, and we can, and because the the major population centers at the time were in the northern Midwest of the United States and the Eastern Seaboard, the navigable waterways make transportation incredibly cheap. And you do so without rail, without having rail, without using railroad transportation. So it was mostly that it was, it, there was a supply of the raw materials in Canada that was plentiful. And it was simply a matter of making it affordable enough to get, the, the, get removing that tariff made it cost effective enough 
to be able to do it with the transportation costs. And uh, but then the question was about the domestic industry. So the domestic industry wasn't power questions. <laughs> but then I, not enough to keep it from going. And in any respects, what they did is they just invested in, they just, you know, uh, international paper company. I mean, they just, money north. they just take the money north. Um, once they realized that was where the, the public, it was, there was a, there's a huge, like, to do between the publishers and the paper makers at the time. And they were really at loggerheads about this, um, both groups lobbying Congress to try to get their own interest. At a certain point, the, the publishers won. Um, you know, there's all that phrase, you know, never argue someone's by the ink by, by the barrel. And the, the paper makers mostly realized that the smart money it was just simply, if you can make the capital investment north of the border, and it's basically the same thing, and you can get away from, you know, the Ameri some of the American paper union, why not just go north of the border and do it there? And so that's what they did. Sorry, please, there are other questions. Yeah. You can talk. It was when our relationship persists today. Not nearly as much, no. Um, the, the demand has gone down, but one of the things that happened after World War II was that the technology came into being to make paper out of southern pine, which until the 40s was not, there was a lot of pitch in it. And also the, the population centers in the United States began moving a lot. So the, the Canadian producers lost some of that advantage because, you know, Houston or Dallas, it's much better to get, get something from a mill built down there. Um, and then the technology became cost effective enough to do it. Um, you know, it required a lot more chemical processing. The hydroelectric facility, the hydro was not as plentiful in the South, which is the, the other major thing that, that they needed to do. But there was, there was some boom in the industry in the American South, in Alabama. There's a huge mill built in Lufkin, Texas, uh, after, immediately after World War II. Um, but that, it did continue, I mean, well into the, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 a lot of the paper still did and still does come from Canada, but it's just not, not at the volume that it used to. And most of those towns have really, I mean, this is a story you find all across paper mill towns on both sides of the border, whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or Maine or New Brunswick, is that that, that mill is, it, it just, it's just not cost effective to do that anymore. So, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's, yeah, it, it, the demand really, it was really a demand issue. But, yeah. What sparked your interest in this movie? Um, well, yeah, so I was, a, I, I was, I've been a media historian for, about 20 years since I started graduate school, and I I started working on um, on, on radio, and because this was about when Web 1.0 was, you know, I thought oh, I'll look at the I'll look at another time where there was a major media revolution and see if I can make sense of, and what I found was that it, that the, the the successful what happened what I saw what I found was that the newspaper publishers adapted to this new medium just by buying radio stations or starting them. So you can find this, and this is this happened quite a bit in Canada as well. And you can find this in a lot of. I always do this whenever I go to a city that I don't know. So you can you often find the call letters. Uh, it's the vestige of the, the newspaper that owned it years ago. So like, um, you know, WGN in Chicago is the world's greatest newspaper. Um, WTMJ in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Journal. So it, this involved a lot of looking at newspapers' business models. And towards the end of when I was working on it, I, I had all these loose ends about. American publishers being really, really up in arms about the Canadians. Why? I, and I had no, I mean, I just don't, I, I, like like an American newspaper, I had no idea that, that what they meant was the people that they were getting their paper from. And so it just, it, so I, it was just sort of tracking down loose ends. And then I, at something, at some point early in the process, I came across Bay Como and sort of said, oh, so there's this town in, sort of on the St. Lawrence in Northern Quebec that was built by the Chicago Tribune. And it just, I, and then I had the lucky, uh, you know, fortune of meeting Stephen Salmon, who had just, you know, was was towards the tail end of processing this collection of documents, and so I went up there. Oh, and then, so I thought it was initially just going to be something about that town, and then it ended up sprawling out and this thing about all these other things. So you mentioned uh, that there was a lot of demand for pine and spruce in yes. the softer woods. Mm -hmm. I know that after that first wave of cutting, there was more of a monoculture plant mm -hmm. that happened. Yeah. Um, I wondered if your research led you to any kind of insights about the impacts of that monoculture on like, biodiversity, yeah, yeah. climate, that sort of stuff? I, only in a very amateur way. I, I sort of figured out, I, I, I think I can make sense of stuff about forestry now, but I'm by no means in it. But the, the, some of the interesting stuff about that is that the, the, and one of the reasons why the industry was, was developed in Canada the way that it is, there wasn't a lot of biodiversity in some of these northern forests. I mean, it really it wasn't like going to like the Peruvian Andes or something like that.
And the other thing was that the, that the optimal time to cut a spruce tree to make paper, you, you, you could actually, the, the way they had it figured out is if you had a big enough piece of land, you could rotate the cuttings enough that the thing would always be there to use because it wasn't like going to the redwoods or going to cut down these giant sequoias or something. Like you were cutting down trees that were basically like junk, considered junk trees in a lot of ways. So um, that was one of the big things, but I, I, that, that's, it, I, 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 I say much more, I start dipping into things that I'm not knowledgeable about enough to talk about in publisher. <laughs> but no, it's a great question. Um, this may be past your book, yeah. but uh, sometime in the 80s, I seem to recall, USA Today was the first newspaper yeah. that it wasn't, I mean, although it had a geographic basis, yeah. unlike the Chicago Tribune yep. or something, where it's a local newspaper, yep. it started using satellite technology yep. to print across the country. Yeah. And I think the Global Mail was the first here mm -hmm. in Canada. Yeah. I was just wondering if that affected the industry in, in any significant way. I don't know if it affected the, the news print side, and it definitely kept demand up at a time that it was falling. The USA Today, in 1982, yeah. it's, it's, it, I mean, the, the, the decline of the newspaper industry is stunningly recent. You yeah. know, uh, these, the New York Times uh, also had developed into a national paper by adopting that same model of, of mm -hmm. using printing plants at an excess capacity or extra capacity, and then that's why you could buy a New York, get a New York Times in the morning in Denver mm -hmm. or something like that. So um, yeah, that was a big, yeah, that began, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I, I did, did it affect? I, I mean, I, it, it kept. It, it certainly kept demand for newsprint up to some degree at a time when, at the local level, competition was shrinking, sizes of editions were shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they were still. Real, it was really a story that you know, I, I think it's like the mid '90s when newspapers stopped becoming the number one advertising right. sort of source of advertising in the media business. So it was part of a, a moment that newspapers were still incredibly powerful. Profitable. I mean, you know, CNN and, and USA Today are products of the same. Right. Like they founded the same year. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 This is sort of an off the wall question because it doesn't involve newspapers, but newsprint mm -hmm. is used in the um, packing, moving industry. Uh -huh. like if you move house, they pack everything in newsprint. And art circles use newsprint, you know, just for practice, yeah. whatever. Did you look at, I, I just bought your book, but did you look into other uses of newsprint? I don't in the book, I, it, it's a, there, but I have thought about this. It's a fascinating sort of life cycle. I mean, I've, I've heard of people who, who lived in rural areas who say that their, their home insulation was actually newsprint. It's um, fabulous and yeah. inexpensive. Yeah, we used to do that. I mean, the, only, the only bad thing is you gotta wash all your glasses when you get to the new place because the ink is rubbed <laughs> off on them. Yeah. No, but I'm talking yeah. about unused. Uh, I moved house yeah. and a friend of mine uh, got me rolls of newsprint that hadn't been printed on. Oh, oh, wow. And I packed my own china. Oh, no, I haven't seen so you. Didn't, this must be, no, but the movie industry is still existing. Yeah. And people still have to move objects. They can't send them by fax. Right. Or, or, or email. <laughs> you, you, so you didn't yeah, no, look at No, I, I didn't look at so, it. So no, maybe, I, yeah. maybe the, the, the right. pulp and paper producers yeah. are going to concentrate now on the move, movie industry rather than newspapers. I have seen it. We did, the last time we moved, we did buy it. There's like this, uh, I forgot the brand that it was, but it's basically these like broadside. You have, these broadside sheets of clean, it's, ba it's clean. basically it's newsprint. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I haven't looked at that, but it's, it's a fascinating thing. It, it, it does speak to, I mean, these things have a life cycle, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yes? Yeah, just on the names of the newspaper. Yeah. Like in the US, we find most of the names from the city, like yeah. New York Times, Washington Post. In Canada, we have Golden Wheel, National Post. Right. And, and the reason I'm asking this question is back home in India, yeah. the newspaper has Country as a name. Yeah. And there's a library, there's one of the biggest libraries in India, has economist, has financial times. Uh -huh. and I, yeah, I used to ask my dad, why don't you have New York Times or, or Washington Post? Yeah. Said, no, 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 we don't go with foreign city names. Like financial times is generic. Right. Economist is generic. Yeah. So is there any history about the naming of the newspaper? This globalization or yeah. something? I mean, it's, that was fascinating for me. Yeah, no, it, I, it just goes that they were they, these were in, these were profoundly local institutions. I mean, until I mean, you, they were all most of them. Were, there were very few that were founded 
after World War II. I mean, most of these papers, you, you know, you can tra if you trace the, the name backwards, you find that at some point they were either called a Republican or a Democrat. And at a certain point they change to, there's a moment where they, they go from having a party name to having something like Herald or Sun or something that goes to like, you know, shedding light on. But they were profoundly local institutions. And then they, at a certain point, they, they, there was mergers and consolidations at the local level. But yeah, I mean, it, it, USA Today was the one, I think they had the technology and the capability to do it. And they piggybacked on what magazines had done. So what we had in the, what in the US is, we didn't really have at the national level the, the same tradition of weekly of weekly newspapers, but we, but there was a vibrant circulation of national magazines, so you know, Collier's and that sort. So we had it in, in that respect. But yeah, I mean, that, the USA Today was really the one that did that because they, they they were local institutions. So they all just started with the local. Media. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't. I, I I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head that would be different than that. I mean, maybe something. I mean, the Wall Street Journal in some respect might be like that. Um, <coughs> In the sense that it has a street name and it's clearly a New York financial newspaper, but it but it is a national and internationally put like you don't need to be a New Yorker to have the experience of that of that paper. Um, but, but that's a, that's recent. That, that's a recent thing for the Wall Street Journal. For the Wall Street Journal, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. 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 The Christian Science Monitor. Right? Yeah. There's, but it's these are they're local business. They're local. They're just these profoundly local institutions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Michael, thank you very very much. I don't know. Thank you.